Um, I don't think there's a, any more main announcements. The reason why Mary's not here with me at the moment, she is actually talking to some spirits who want to give you a message. So um, she's madly writing the message, uh, which we'll be using as a part of the discussion today with you. So what we're going to do today is talk about a subject that we hope will sort of uh, encourage you some as well, and, uh, and hopefully give you some ideas of what to do in terms of your day-to-day -day life and in enjoying your day-to-day -day life more. So, and that's the subject today. I won't disclose the subject just yet until Mary comes. Hopefully she's nearly done, I think. And tomorrow afternoon, we've decided we will also have a session here uh, from about 1.30 onwards, if we can, tomorrow. Um, and later in the afternoon, the discussion is going to be about desires and passions, about how to discover what you really want to do with your life. That's going to be the subject of the discussion tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Um, now, I understand there's a few new faces here that I haven't seen before. Welcome. Um, and uh, I understand some, someone's from, Sweden, uh, from Switzerland here. You go, you go. Yeah, awesome. Welcome. Uh, so we've got some from Germany, some from Switzerland, um, some from Australia, some from... Um, where else are we from? Cyprus. Crete? Cyprus. Cyprus. Cyprus? 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 England? England? Yeah. Here's Mary, so she just... <laughs> now, um, Katerina has uh, a couple of sets of... DVDs of introductory pack DVDs if you want to take them with you. They're up the back just behind the green donation box that's there. Um, you'll see some DVDs there if you want to take those with you. They're for free, so, you, so if you haven't got any and you'd like to take some, then feel free to take them. How are you doing, darling? <laughs> now, the reason why I haven't told you the subject of today's talk is because... Um, I wanted to wait until Mary came because we want to uh, give you some of the information that uh, her sp our spirit friends have want to give you today. Your spirit friends. Actually. Your spirit friends, actually. <laughs> um, so the subject that we want to discuss today with you is about spirit guides and guardians um, and your relationship with your guides and guardians. Does that make sense? So that's what we'd like to talk with you about today. Now, God's made this system, which is a, a really beautiful system, to, to actually help you with your life. Like a lot of times in our life on earth, we don't feel like we really have much help. Like a lot of times it feels like we're going through life um, a, bit, a bit rudderless without having much assistance from other people. And a lot of times when you go to ask another person about what's happening with your life, they're just as clueless about their life as you are about your own. So, so we end up finishing up discovering life through a process of experience, right? And in that process, we forget that God's actually given us a permanently assigned to us, basically, two assistants. They're, the reason why we forget that they're assigned is because they're both invisible to us. And so we forget that they are being assigned to us. And so the majority of people on earth have no idea that the, these spirits, these people who used to live on earth, um, have been assigned to them to help them through their life. The first person that's assigned to you, which is assigned to you uh, from the moment of your conception actually onwards, is your guardian. And your guardian is a spirit whose attempts to let you know when you're in dangerous situations and help you get out of those dangerous situations. So that's their primary role. So they attempt to guide you or, gu or guard you from harm and the harm that they're guarding you from is not just harm of what might happen to you on the earth. There's also harm that could happen to you from spirits as well and they, to the best of their power, attempt to guard you from that harm as well without breaking the laws of God doing so. So that's the role of the guardian. 
and the guardian generally stays with you almost uh, your entire life or until you no longer need a guardian. Now, for most people, it's their entire life. And very few people don't no longer need a guardian until they pass into the spirit world and then they no longer need a guardian. So, so the guardian role is uh, often given to family spirits who have been before you, who have, who have been on earth before you and uh, have passed over into the spirit world and they've progressed to a certain level of love where they can love you and care for you, understanding the laws of God at the time. And these guardians um, often have a frustrating time of it because, because we're trying to do things and we're often doing things that are dangerous things in their, in their eyes. And so they're trying to protect us in that environment. And sometimes they'll try to protect you by dropping thoughts into your mind by saying, you shouldn't be here. Well, why are you here? <laughs> you need to go away from here or something like that. And other times they try to influence other people around you in order to protect you if they can't protect you by talking to you directly. So that's the guardian. Is there any questions about your guardian like, that you'd like to... Because what we want to do is meet some of your guardians and meet some of your guides. Does that make sense? So, so later we'll have, we'll have some channeling. We'll do some channeling and you'll actually meet some of your guardians and meet some of your guides and hear what they really think about you and your life, <laughs> and, uh, and so forth, right? They already, they already want to say that they don't find it frustrating. No. Many of them feel deeply honoured to have that role in your life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so they don't find it as frustrating as I'm making out, but, uh, but because they, they see it as a precious assignment yes. given to them by God, actually, assigned by God, and given to them so that they have a role in your life and so they are intimately acquainted with your life. They know pretty much, sometimes they know far more about us than we ourselves remember. They, they remember more things about our lives than we remember, oftentimes, because oftentimes we want to forget things that they remember. Yeah. <laughs> so we want to talk with some of your guardians and see, see how they feel about the role, but also they might bring up issues of that, you know, where they see areas of protection that, uh, that are open in your life, where, where you're not as safe as what you think you are, that, that if you could listen to them or hear them, that they'd be able to help you work through those issues. The second role, which is assigned to you, is assigned to you when you begin the process of spiritual investigation of some kind. So... Uh, for many of us, that process begins in our sort of early, uh, late, late childhood, early teenage life, where we start asking questions. And for many of us, we ask the questions very early in our life, like, you know, when we're three, four, five years of age, we often start asking spiritual questions of our family. And unfortunately, for many of us, our family have no idea how to answer those questions. And so they give us answers that they were given by their own parents generally, or they just say, oh, look, I don't know. And, and unfortunately for many of us, we have a tendency then to, um, to just say, oh, nobody knows, and so we stop our investigation. But usually our investigation of spiritual matters starts at quite a young age. Like usually, you know, sh shortly after three years of age generally, we start asking lots of questions about life, many of which our parents are either uncomfortable answering because they feel that we're not developed enough to understand the answer, or that our parents don't know the answer. Uh, we, as a child, we often ask very direct questions, um, questions that, that are very, very difficult for most people on the planet to answer. And so we learn at a very young age that some questions you don't bother asking anymore, which is unfortunate because we couldn't get answers to most questions, or all questions, in fact. So our guide, at the time we start asking questions, our, gu our guides are assigned to us. Now, our guides are people who have an interest in the certain field of endeavour that you have and therefore have more knowledge in that field than you have, but who are more versed in love than you are. So, so for example, if you started at a very young age, started to having a scientific bent, like a, an interest in science. And I remember when I was five years of age, I, I bought a chemistry set and I was making little bombs out in the backyard <laughs> and things like that, <laughs> um, as you do. Um, 
And uh, I had an interest in science at that age. And when you have an interest like that, you also then have a guide who has a common interest in the same kind of field as what you're now interested in. And that guide can guide you in that direction. But part of their role is to also guide you in the direction of understanding the universe and understanding how everything works, understanding how um, the whole universe uh, operates in terms of its laws and such. Now, these guides don't know everything. They only know what they themselves have discovered. And, and sometimes they have a certain field of discovery and they haven't much interest in other fields of discovery. Does that make sense? So sometimes they have an interest in a certain, uh, certain form of discovery, um, like, for example, science, but they don't have an interest in philosophy or they don't have an interest in history or they don't have an interest in archaeology or other forms of discovery. And so what they do is when, they, when you're interested in that particular thing, they guide you, but when you're no longer interested, they then say, oh, well, he's no longer interested in that area or she's no longer interested in that area, so I will leave and find another person and, and be assigned, usually, by higher spirits to another person who has an interest in that area. And then wherever we have now changed our focus we get a guide who's interested in that area of expertise to guide us in terms of discovery of the truths in that particular area. Now, that also applies from a spiritual perspective. So, so for example, if I was interested in uh, Christianity, then I'd have a guide who is then connected to Christianity in the spirit world, still a Christian in the spirit world, who then guides me in terms of what they've discovered in the spirit with, with, that, with, with that area of endeavour. If I'm interested in New Age philosophy, then I'll have a guide who's more interested in New Age philosophy. And now it doesn't mean that the Christian or the New Age philosopher in the spirit world knows everything about the truth about those matters. They just know more than you do right, about that particular field of endeavour and they can guide you to the discovery of what they know through a process of influence. They're always going to be more developed in love, aren't they? Yes. They're always going to have... So sometimes we might attract spirits who have a similar interest who aren't our guides. They're just uh, someone who's passed and they think, yeah, this person on earth is interested in what I was interested in and so they go along for the ride. But your guide is someone specifically assigned to you who has more love than you uh, already within them, so they're in a higher sphere in the spirit world, and they are there specifically to guide you towards more love. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and that's and as Mary pointed out, that's very different to a general spirit who's around you, who has a general interest in the same area of expertise that you have, and so forth, and who's who who wants to then influence you down that track. And it's also very different to any malevolent spirits that you might have around you, because many of us do have malevolent spirits around us. And those spirits generally want to influence us off any track and down into the same level of debauchery they discovered through their life, generally. So, so we have all of these external influences around us at any one point in time, but the positive influence is always our guide and our guardian, the, the two separate roles of those two particular people. And sometimes it's one person who has both roles. Other times it's two separate people that have those separate roles and yeah. in each case they have both been assigned by higher spirits who have been who and the assignment really comes from god it's a direct desire of god's to bring all of humanity into a higher spiritual condition and so this assignment is made to every person even if we don't believe in spirits even if we don't believe in anything other than the physical it's still we still have these spirits assigned to us does that make sense, everyone? Mm -hmm. Now, is there any questions you'd like to ask about that so far? Rita? No, I have a question. Just wait for that mic to okay. point in your face there. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question. How do we know if uh, guardians drop thoughts in our mind? How do we know? How can we distinguish if it's a thought from a guardian or a guide and, or from a lower spirit? Or a thought from our own fear. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is also possible, isn't it? Yeah. Yep, so that's a good question. How can we distinguish the difference? Well, 
If we always remember that our guide and guardian are in a higher condition of love than we are, then they won't be dropping thoughts into our mind that cause fear within us generally. They'll be dropping thoughts into our mind, though, that allow us to take action. So, so for example, if I, have a, if I think of taking some action, let's say I, take, say I decide I want to go on an overseas trip, which is something you've, you've done recently, right? So you want to go on an overseas trip, you're thinking of taking some action. If all of a sudden you just get thoughts coming into your mind about you shouldn't go, it's really, really bad, you're going to, it's dangerous, and you, get all, and you get all those kind of thoughts coming into your mind, then obviously the person who's giving you those thoughts is either yourself in fear or spirits around you who are also in fear, who are, who are pushing you to not do what you desire. With regard to your guides and your guardians, they will always encourage you to do what you desire but they'll, bring it, they'll want to bring it more into harmony with love. So they'll, they'll be encouraging you to go on the trip because it's something you desire, but they would also let you know what to take care with when you engage your desire. So this is one thing we would like to discuss with you as to how you can connect more strongly with these guides and with your guardian. And one of the ways is by engaging your desires with more passion. Because when you engage your desires, it's very, very hard for negative spirits to drop thoughts into your mind that are all negative that try to tune you away from your desires. Does that make sense? Yep. It makes sense a lot. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> but we'll talk about that because we want to read what some of our guides, what Mary's guides have channeled for you. And these are your guides, actually, that have channeled this through Mary um, as to how to maintain a connection with them, uh, a stronger connection. So at the moment, what they find is that because of different... Uh, physical and spiritual uh, things in your environment, they find it difficult to guide you at times. And what they would like to do is find it a lot easier to have a stronger connection with you because it also means the connection is far more enjoyable, right? And so, and so what they'd like to do is talk to you about some basic things that you can do to improve your own connection with them. And once, we, we, once you have those basic things happening, then it's much, much easier for them to communicate with you more openly, to influence you by helping you to do what you desire. So these guides and guardians in a higher state of love, they're not trying to control you. Lower spirits will try to control you, but higher spirits don't try to control you. What they're trying to do is they're trying to help you engage your desires with passion and then they're trying to help you bring those desires into more harmony with love. That's their underlying goal. So they're not trying to push you around or force you to do things or control you. Now, other spirits around us at times do that, but our guide and guardian will never, ever choose to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah? I have another, Rita? I have another question. Uh, our guides and guardian, guardian, guides and whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can they be anyone in the um, or above the second sphere? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So they are not necessarily a celestial spirit. That's correct. Yep. They they are often not celestial spirits. They are often people who are given your uh, the role of guiding or guarding you mm -hmm. for their own development as well. They, they mm -hmm. actually they actually receive benefits by being with you as well mm -hmm. through the. So process. is it similar to the grandmother of Patchett? Uh, yes, in, in Paget's grandmother's case. Mm -hmm. uh, now, for those of you who don't aware, um, Paget is a man who channeled material in the 1920s, and he had a grandmother in the spirit world who was his guardian, uh, sorry, his guide. His father was his guardian, but his, his grandmother was his guide. But his grandmother had discovered the divine truth, and she had been progressing on the divine truth, and she was a celestial spirit, and, and she... Ha was assigned to guide Paget, um, so she guided him in his investigation for spiritual truth. And because he had a very strong desire to, uh, for God, and a very strong desire to understand the truths about God, because she was a divine love guide, she knew all the truths about God. She could be assigned to him. But if Paget had a desire to know about um, some other form of endeavour then she would not have been assigned to him, even if she was 
his grandmother. grandmother. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Katerina? Um, is there a case where the guardian, or I'm sorry, the guide has another guide above them, guiding them? Yes, that is usually always the case. Every single okay. person who's ever lived has had somebody who's guided them in the past and also who ha even after you pass into the spirit world, you will often continue to have a person who's a guide. However, the difference is you can see them. So, right. so they actually come to you as a friend attempting to guide you and you actually physically see them. Yep. Oh, because I, I thought I, I had seen, but I wasn't sure because, like, I could understand um, a guide much closer to me, but then behind that person was something bigger that I, could not cl I couldn't see. Exactly. But it was like a, an outline. Yep. And I was wondering, well, why is that person further in the back, but really yeah. big and really non-threatening, yeah. non but yeah, yeah. I could not communicate with that person in the back. And that's because he is so far developed really that he wouldn't be able really. to easily communicate with you. Does that make sense? I would not be able to communicate with him, though. With him. That's correct. Yes, because... And I... you can't easily hear him either. Right. Yep. I can't. Yep. Sometimes I get the vision of the bigger person behind yep. someone else. Yep. But I cannot... Um, yep. And or some... I don't want to, I don't know. <laughs> well, sometimes it does happen that... Even our guide is maybe a celestial guide, but because of the resistance or the condition we're in at the time, they use an intermediary to convey their message. Yep. So that happens for me sometimes <laughs> when I'm in total resistance. I can't talk to, the, to, to my true guide, but they assign someone to who's, who I'm going to be more open to in that moment because yeah. their love is too... I'm resisting their love so much. Yeah. There was one time in Australia where myself and Mary were staying in a city in, in Brisbane and I'll just wait for that. Welcome. <laughs> Come in. Hi. How are you? We're just talking about spirit guides and guardians. Yep. So there was a time when myself and Mary were in a city and our guides couldn't speak to us because of the different things around us that were happening at the time. And these two third sphere spirits came and spoke to Mary. And after a while I'm going, these don't sound like our guides at all. And then they, they said who they were and, and, and they realised that you know they weren't always accurately reflecting the message that was given to them but uh, after a while they re realised the role they were in a role of intermediary role yep mm. and, um, was that because you were resistive to hear your guides at the time or did these people just wanted to say something to you it was more about me and how open I was feeling to emotion at the time um, so because I often find it overwhelming when I speak to our guides, um, these these third sphere spirits had were kind of natural. They'd been natural love spirits for uh, on the natural love path for a long time on Earth, and then after they passed, and they're just trying to make this transition. And so, they were, there was much less emotion in them. Um, so they were more verbal. They were more verbal and intellectual, and so they could receive the message from the celestial guide and then convey it to me in a way that I was open to on that day. And, and even my whole... It wasn't until AJ went, whoa, what's going on here? And I looked down and even my whole manner was formal. They felt very like this was a very important job they were given and they were <laughs> going to do it very formally and that it was all very uh, formal they, language. They almost went sort of holy on us. Yes. You know? <laughs> And uh, yeah, and it was really unusual to hear somebody do that because we're used to talking to our guides who are very down to earth. Uh, when I say down to earth, they, you know, they, they don't go, yeah. and, they don't go holy and and rigid or any of those kind of things. They, they're very relaxed with us. Is probably the best term. Um, and these these people who spoke to us just briefly. Um, did not feel relaxed. They felt like they themselves were quite nervous in the role. Mm. And so, yeah, you could tell the difference by their feelings, yeah? Mm. Mm. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. So, 
behind you. Um, I was thinking that when you said about the resistance as well, how often that happens just amongst humans. Yes. Like someone else has to give you the message because yes. you're not ready to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the guides and guardians, can they also be the set assigned to the, another person or it's specifically to you? Um, usually it is specifically to you, but there are certain times when a guide or a guardian may be assigned to two people. One of those times is if those two people are soulmates. So often if the, there's two people and both of them are soulmates and are together, then they may finish up having the same guide, for example. Um, that, that can frequently occur. Some guides are powerful enough to actually manage more than one person at a time. Yeah. Uh, in other words, they are so far advanced in the spirit world that they can have multiple concurrent connections with people at the speed that people can handle the connection. Um, as, the, as a person progresses in the spirit world, they're able to handle multiple emotional concurrent connections with ease. And so the higher the guide becomes, the more possibility there is that he will ha or she will handle more than one person at the same time in terms of guiding one, more than one person. Um, so there are times when a guide can be guiding more than one person because of the power of the guide. However, under those circumstances for most people on earth, those kind of guides need intermediaries to help the person because they themselves, uh, the person on earth finds it difficult to hear them uh, or to listen to their um, prompt promptings because of our condition on earth. Yeah. 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 Um, if we go to Nico. Can somebody ask a, a guide to guide them, a person? Um, you can, but the asking has to be based on what you feel rather than what you think. So, so for example, you could say, oh, I want to have a divine love guide to guide me. But what you feel is you really would like to stay on the natural love path of development, then what you're feeling is what you'll be assigned, not what you think. Does that make sense, Nico? So, so it's all about what you feel. You have to feel it strongly for the assignment to occur. If you don't feel it strongly and you only think it, then the assignment generally does not occur until you feel it. Remember that feeling is the prayer. So whenever we feel something and we feel it harmonious with God's love, then we're really in a state of prayer with God. So, so if I have a strong feeling that I would love to have a person who understands the truths of the universe to come and teach me those truths, and I really feel that, then a guide who knows those truths of the universe will come and be assigned to me. But I have to feel it. If I only think it, and it's not really a strong feeling, then it's highly unlikely that a, a guide of that type would be assigned to me. Does that make sense, Nico? Yep. yep. Who else had their hand up? Rita. Rita and, and okay, Sarah. So let's go to Sarah first. Yeah. No, Sarah first. Sarah. Um, I had this cool experience yesterday on the flight here. Um, where just before we're about to take off, I like put my hand up against the window, mm -hmm. and I felt like this beautiful spirit put the hand up too. And yeah. then there were just like hundreds of like spirits like guiding the plane, like everyone's guardians. Yeah. And I was just like, whoa! And then I, and they were like, yeah, there's very precious cargo on this plane. And yeah. I'm like, there is. And they're like, <laughs> <laughs> and they're like every single person. And I'm like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I felt completely safe like I'm not a nervous flyer anyway but I was like yeah and they were like yeah we're just here to and they were just there to just oh it's beautiful yeah and, and, and yeah I just knew I was going to be completely safe too yeah. when it was and it's interesting with things like that because with flight obviously there is dangers uh of, you know in terms of the engines and the the aircraft itself and so forth and actually many times our guides or sorry our guardians prompt engineers and other people to actually see or notice things that are on the flight. Um, 
that we may not have noticed before, that the engineers may not have noticed. Yeah, yeah. I sort of felt that. And I'm like, is this flight in danger? And they're like, no, 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 we're, we're just, you know, they're like, oh, there's a bit of weather, but you were just, you know, prompting it. And no, yeah. but it'll be fine. And but they drop thoughts into the yeah. pilot's mind to circumnavigate some weather. And, they, you know, they do all of these things without yeah. many people on Earth being no. aware. <laughs> oh, I wasn't until I was happening. like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. And just so gently, too. That yeah, like, that's right. Just Gently moving along. Yeah. Like and they're not fear mongers. You know, no, they're not fear based. It, the fe- it's usually the, oh, we've got to do it, we've got to do it, which is the fear. And that's why they feel so gentle. They're like, no, it's all right. Yeah. Everything's relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's cool. Yeah. They, they don't, uh, they're not worried necessarily about our death because obviously they know that we don't die anyway. But they are concerned about our welfare and our desires being met. And many people who are living on Earth obviously have strong desires to remain alive on Earth for as long as possible. And for that reason, um, our guardians spend a lot of their time making sure that that's possible. Uh, by, and they often do prompt all sorts of things like maintenance of vehicles and all sorts of things like that are prompted by our guides very frequently. Our uh, guardians, sorry, very frequently. Yeah. Uh, Rita, yeah. you want it next, and then we go back to. Um, when I was small in the Catholic tradition, we learned to pray to the Sch- Schutzengel. That's a, a sort of protecting angel. Yes. And we did that every night, and it was really nice. And we believed it also. Is there something to it? Yeah, there yeah. cer- certainly is. That what what they were encouraging you to do is to pray or talk to your guardian, and so. Um, and, and it's a lovely thing to do. Yeah. Um, some of it was driven in the Catholic religion by superstition, of course. Mm-hmm. Like, if I didn't do that, then somebody might punish me. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's some guilt associated sometimes with different religions in doing it. But the reality is you, do, you can actually enter a very close relationship with your guardian. And the main reason why is because they're with you all of your life. And so they know you very well. They know your thoughts. They know your desires. They, they have a good understanding of you as a person, far better than anyone on earth generally yeah. does. I have no, another question. When we grew up, we had a big book with all the holy saints in it. Yes. And we usually were named, so I was named after the Holy Rita in Italy. Yeah. Yeah. And I read every, everything about her life. And, um, and we also we celebrated the name day. Mm-hmm. So we, we Almost had, like we, a birthday. More, we didn't celebrate the birthday. We yeah. only celebrated the name day. So we had three Ritas in our class. Yeah. And are they also then guardians or guides, those holy people? <laughs> um, well, many of those so-called holy people are divided into two categories. One is uh, a person who's been developed in the natural love path to the sixth dimension of the spirit world. And others are people that have continued their development on the divine love path into the celestial spheres of the spirit world, eight sphere or above. Now, often when they become a, a person like that, they are well known in many with, by many other spirits in the spirit world, and so then they are encouraged to be sainted, if you like, through different uh, processes on earth. Now, they don't see themselves as saints, um, although some of the six sphere spirits do see themselves as saints. None of the celestial spirits see themselves as saints. But they do obviously like having a connection with people on earth that they can help or influence in some way into finding further truth. So while they don't sort of honour the whole idea of sainthood, they do uh, like the idea of being able to connect to people on earth because the people on earth are interested in that particular person. So, So it creates a friendship which then can be a bond, which then can be utilised to help you, to, to actually teach you things. So it is a wonderful arrangement still. Yeah, or, or also it was, it was just a role model. It was sort of a role model to yes. read about all those, yeah. what they suffered and like the Holy Rita, she had children and her husband died and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes it's very similar to our own life, it turns out. And there are reasons why that is even the case yeah. too. Yeah. Would you go back to... <clears throat> um, when I was in kindergarten, I, I remember when I was waiting for my mother at work to, for her to finish. I was talking to, I don't know now if he's, it was a guide or a spirit guide or yeah. a guardian, yeah. uh, but it was very interesting um, talks, like he was teaching me stuff, yeah. and 
I could see him. Yeah. I remember him. And yeah. I was offering chocolate and he never <laughs> he ate. Yeah, I was yeah, like, no, it's you. But was it a guardian or a um, spirit guide he was teaching? Yeah, the spirit guide is the one who does most of the teaching of a person. So he is your guide at the time. Um, he can also have the dual role of being your guardian, of course, but he's obviously guiding you as well, causing yes. you to learn faster. The reality is that people on earth have a, have a far greater ability to learn than most people on earth realise, and these spirits help us greatly with learning things that we can't learn from our families, you know, our, that our families are quite close to actually understanding. Our spirit guides can open our areas of investigation in our life far beyond what our family scope is. And, uh, and if we allow that to occur, and our families allow that to occur, um, then we have the ability to learn many things outside of what our family would be able to teach us generally, or the school could even teach us generally. Yes? Yeah. They are very focused on teaching you about human nature, human feelings, the, re the response to different feelings, why some people act the way they do, what's their underlying emotional condition that causes them to act in such a way. A lot of, uh, if you think back to your childhood, a lot of times we understand those things better in our childhood than we do sometimes once we become an adult. And one of the reasons why is because the more adult we become, generally the more detuned emotionally we become from our own feelings and therefore and also from the feelings of others and and so therefore we have less understanding and when we were a child oftentimes we had a greater understanding it was more like a an instinctual understanding when we were a child compared to us trying to use our intellect to understand when we're an adult yeah. it, was, it was just like remembering like when he was telling me all these things, it was just like, oh yeah, yeah, like yeah, that's right. Not learning, but just remembering somehow. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's um, easy. Because they also have a feeling when they're giving you this information. They know it very well, and uh, and a child is very open to the discovery of knowledge, um, far more open to the discovery of knowledge than an adult is generally on Earth. We have the ability to all be far more open. But unfortunately, that ability gets closed down through the process of our childhood. So by the time we become a teenager on Earth, generally we're quite close to learning new things that we would have been quite open to learning when we were a child. And so when they teach us these new things, it's almost like, oh, it's like, almost like remembering them for us. Or it's just, oh, yeah, I get that, I get that, I get that. You know, the, the, the truths come to us very, very rapidly as a result of... It happening during our childhood. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Nick. How are you? Um, could the guide or the guardian manifest itself, himself, herself, uh, or be felt as an animal or as a non-human form? It's very unusual for that to occur. Um, it's usually darker spirits who do that, who manifest themselves in a, in a non-human form. The reason why is that most of our guides and guardians have a strong desire for us to know them exactly as they are, rather than sort of thinking that they're something else other than what, what they are. And so many spirits of a darker nature will manifest themselves in some other form. And, and in fact, if you look at On Earth recently, there is a lot of uh, manifestation of sort of like dragon spirits or... Or, or animal-based spirits, lizards, um, and all of these other types of spirit, uh, manifestations, they're usually um, spirits who are not developed in love as much as our guides and who also generally sometimes trying to scare people as well. Now, sometimes, though, um, we have animals who we used to have on Earth who have died and those animals are now in a spirit form and we do have the ability to see those animals. So if you have a very favourite pet, for example, that you know died when you were a child, well, it's highly likely that pet will remain around you in, the spirit, in spirit form until your own passing. And there will be times when you will actually see them, when you'll see them with your spirit body's eyes 
the actual pet being around you. So, so that's different than a spirit faking themselves as an animal. There are actually animals, when your animals pass, as long as they have a central nervous system, they have a spirit body, and when they pass, if you love them, they will often be around you all of the rest of your life, and you will often see them. And sometimes if you have children, your children will actually play with them. You'll actually notice your children laughing and giggling with something invisible, and you don't understand what it is, and it's often the, the pet or whatever it is that is a part of your life still. Now, that's different to a spirit who tries to portray itself as an animal, and spirits who try to do that generally are collections of spirits, and, uh, and they don't like to portray themselves as they are, because if they did, you would see that their condition is darker than what, it really, than, than what they want you to believe it is. And so you often see the difference between those things. Now, today we might have an opportunity to talk to some of those spirits as well who do that. So, so what, we're, what we're wanting to do is dis discuss some of these things with you and then give you some directions in terms of what your spirit guides feel can happen to connect better. And then once we've done that, we might try to do a bit of channeling of some of these different spirits and see how you go determining which one's what. Like, what, you know, like that kind of thing, working out who... Whose guide is this? Whose guardian is this? Or what other spirits are surrounding us at the time? At the time? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Regarding the manifesting as animals and things, something that the, all of your guides stressed to me this morning was about the fact that they want to have more of a relationship with you. And so if you have a false conception of them, like that they're an animal, this actually distances their, their ability to relate to you in a real sense. So, mm. yeah. Yeah, that's why mm -hmm. higher spirits generally avoid... Or, higher spirits always avoid any misconception and they avoid any... Um, um, well, lies, really. P portraying lies to p people on Earth. And they don't try to make things... Um, especially spirits on the divine love path, they don't try to add an air of mystery or intrigue or you have to figure something out. It has to... It, you know... It, it, they usually try to be as plain as possible. Um, They're very honest and direct. Yeah. yeah, very honest and direct. Just like you would expect the person who loves you on earth to be, to be yeah. um, honest and direct with you. They won't try to falsify things with you. They won't try to make something seem like it's not. And they won't do any of those things with you. Mm. And if any spirit does do that with you, then it's a good indication that that spirit's of a darker condition. Yep. Uh, I would like to know, like, what in our condition defines the condition of our spirit guide, really? I mean, what def is, is there something that really in our condition that defines, like, if it's celestial or not a celestial, second, third, fourth, fifth sphere? And there are certain factors that, that define why certain guides are assigned to us, mm. but they're more to do with our personality and nature than they mm. are to do... Okay. Uh, the, as well as our desires. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if we had a desire to discover God, then there's, a, then there's a high likelihood we'll be assigned at some point in our life a divine love guide who would assist us through that process. Does that make sense? Um, the reason why it's pointing at me now is because I'm the one talking. <laughs> I'm pretty far away from you. <laughs> no, it still, it still gets me. Um, so, so what happens is that uh, our spirit friends, um, they... They are assigned to us both based on our desires, but there's also this other aspect, and this other aspect is to do with our personality, characteristics, and attributes, and nature. So every single person on the planet, and every single person in the spirit world, is um, has a different personality or nature. And but there are some people who are very similar to you in nature, who are, who who uh, would find your nature far more enjoyable to be with than other people would find it. Does that make sense? And in other words, they generally have similar desires, they have a similar type of personality. So some people are more retrospective or more um, introspective than others. Mm -hmm. Some people are more outgoing and extrovert mm -hmm. than others. And um, so the spirit guide who's assigned to you, if the, if the true personal nature was one of being an extrovert, mm -hmm. then it's highly unlikely an introvert spirit would be assigned mm -hmm. to you. Does that make sense? There are people who delight in the same things that you do. Yeah. yeah. Even if, even if perhaps uh, at the time you're very injured and you're not finding delight 
in the areas that your true nature would guide you to. Yeah. The person who guides you has delight in those things that you your true nature and personality is going to... Like knowing already what my true nature would lead me to at some stage. And exactly. Then really and helping me to discover that, really. Role. And that's part of their role. Right. Yeah. How, yeah. They, okay. Part of their role is helping you discover mm -hmm. you. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good system. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's a good system. Because a lot of times on Earth we are very detuned from us because of what's happened to us in our environment. We're often very detuned from what we really want to do ourselves or detuned from our desires and passions. And so having a, having a spirit who's with you is awesome because they, they can help you discover those things even if your family or your environment has shut them down inside yeah. of you. Yeah. And this is why a lot of times as we grow into our teenage life, we start sort of going out in different directions that our family is very confronted with. Yeah. And often it's our guide that's influencing us to do this because he, he or she knows, no, your true nature is this direction, not the family's direction, but in this direction. And oftentimes your personality or nature will challenge your family as a result of you fully expressing your own personality and nature. And your guide knows that. So your guide's like there like a friend. He can say, no worries, your family might be against you for the moment, but I'm still with you. <laughs> I'm still with you. I'm still helping you out. Right? I'm still, uh, you know, you've got me, you've got me along. I understand what's going on and it's pretty bad what's happening with your family. They might be attacking you and so forth and so forth. But, but you don't need to worry too much about that because you've still got a friend. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And you have. Yeah. 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 It's beautiful, really. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you said that it's uh, depending on the personality I have in this life, which guardian or guide uh, belongs to me or helps me yes and is it possible that it uh, will change uh, um, why my life because I'm changing my personality in one way or changing my beliefs or my way of thinking way of living yes does it change yes oh, okay. so the difference between your guardian and your guide is your guardian usually does not change frequently the reason why is they are often assigned to you just as soon as you were conceived and are there to protect you through your life that's the role that they have They have their own spiritual progress still. They still grow spiritually in the spirit world. They still discover new things and they are always looking and learning all through their own existence. But, uh, and actually your existence, your daily life, is really only a short amount of time for them because the time is different in the spirit world than it is here on earth. So it's really only a short amount of time for them. But, so they can still experience many other things in the spirit world in their day-to-day -day life. But your guide is very dependent upon your personality and your desires, the mixture of those two things. They are also very dependent upon helping you in areas that you are resistive to growing in. So, so in other words, let's say um, I'd grown up in a very anti-woman environment and let's say I become a teenager and I still quite, you know, I look down upon women by the time I'm a teenager, then you may be assigned a guide who actually is a woman, who, who tries to help you break through this barrier as to why you have so much resistance with women. Does that make sense? So it just depends on your desire to work through these issues as to how they are assigned to you. Uh, but it's very much about your personality and nature and your desires. Now, as you know through your life, your personality and nature does change to a degree, but it is, has a beginning uh, at a certain point. In, in other words, we were conceived with a certain personality and nature. However, we do change sometimes in our personality based on certain realizations we have. Our desires can change like that. We can go from having no desire in a certain area to having a desire in a certain area at the flick of a switch almost. Mm -hmm. And under those circumstances, our guide could change quite rapidly based on the desire changing a guide with a very similar personality and nature will still be a sign, but it will be a guide who has a passion in that area that you've now got a passion in. Mm -hmm. So it so, can change through your life. Yep. And so in the example you gave, if you're raised in a family that's very anti-women, um, it may be that your guide would be a male for a long time until you started to feel, oh, this, I think I need to deal with something here. And then rapidly you're... Because before then you'd be perhaps completely close to hearing from a woman 
But the moment that you start to, even it's a tiny desire, a tiny inkling, something's up here, uh, then a, then your guide could change to be a woman straight yeah. away. Or even if you desire it now, you know, in your teenage life to have a sexual interaction with a woman, now you've got other desires happening, which which you might not have had earlier in your life. And so the guide would be maybe changed at that point in time to help you go mm -hmm. through that process of learning about that and learning about how emotionally you're shut down towards the women so therefore there's sexual issues with the women as well and and a guide might help you go through that particular process yeah and and once you're through that particular process another guide might be assigned because you're now through that process and you don't need help in that particular area and then other you need help in other areas perhaps yeah you okay. uh, I had a spirit guide he, his name was Eli, yeah. and he stayed with me, as I understood, in order to teach me things about what is manhood. Yeah. So I, my next, my current spirit guide can come, which is female. Yeah. So she can help me with my woman's issues. Exactly. And uh, she had to be more of a woman because she's the male part of a female, female uh, half. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm not understanding uh, now. Okay, she's a gay soul so and she's, she's the male part, so I will not be able to fully reject her. Oh, I see what you're saying. What you've realized is that yeah. this, uh, this female spirit who's with you has uh, is is more has more male characteristics in her than uh, her soulmate does, and therefore you find her easier to listen to than if she was just completely. That's the theory. That's, that's what she told me. That's what she told you. Uh, in reality, I have a hard time connecting with her, except <laughs> when she was she is happy yeah. for some reason. Yeah. Or excited. That's the only th times I can connect with her. With the previous guy, I had... Easy connection. It, it, was, it was like I have next to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he told me, you know, you learned what I had to learn you, yeah. to teach you. Yeah. Uh, I stayed a little bit more with you because of the rapport. Yeah. But you know, I have to move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and it's interesting, this uh, assignment that you have now, Nico, because it, it's actually helping you with, to become more open to women through this process of slowly drawing you into that position. <laughs> yeah. See, so, yeah, as you know from your own childhood, you're quite close because of your mother's demands and, and your mother's overbearing nature towards women. And that has prevented you from entering into a close relationship with a woman in the past, yes? Yeah. So, so having a guide who can help you through that transition is excellent. Yeah. <laughs> from time to time, I have emotionally connected with her. Yeah. And she's a woman. Yeah. But she's the real thing, man. Yeah, but she's nothing like your mother. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. First of all, she's gentle, always. Always gentle, yes. And with a certain aspect of femininity that women look and search in women yeah. normally, but it flows. Yeah. It's not a burden for them to, to act like... It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's good, huh? Yeah. 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 So, so what we'd like to do now... Oh, you want to ask a question? Uh, only I'd like to sit down there. Sure, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially now Peter came here. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's fine. Um, you have another question? Good. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, sorry, I came in half an hour later, so I don't know if what I'm going to ask now or you've covered at the beginning. What happens with these guardians and guides in cases of sudden death accidents, addictions, how do they fall short on that and why would they fall short on that? That's a very good question and it hasn't been uh, uh, asked. Um, for a start, your guardian, who is the role of protecting you, 
if we die unexpectedly, um, generally there's only a few reasons why we die unexpectedly. One reason is what you would call accidental. So it's an accident that has occurred through some kind of event, chain of events. The second reason generally is through some kind of ill health or illness that we have that, uh, that came on upon us suddenly perhaps or over a short period of time and, uh, and caused us to die, you know, so even something like cancer or, or other types of illnesses like that. The other two times when we die before our time, as the saying goes. Now, we need to understand, firstly, something about death. None of us need to die, ever. So that's number one. The only reason why we die is because we grow old slowly, and the reason why we grow old slowly is because of the different emotions in us that cause us to shut down our spirit body systems that keep the replication of the cells going in a pure or, or in a perfect manner. So as many of you would know, your cells in your body, every single cell eventually is replaced within seven years. Now some of the cells of your body replace every week and some every month and some over a period of seven years. But what scientists have discovered is that by the time after you're 21 years of age, some of the cells don't reproduce properly. They don't reproduce a clean, perfect cell anymore like they are copying, but they reproduce with an error, and they've called that the death gene. It has an error in the cell reproduction that causes the cell to degrade in its nature. Now... God didn't create us with that. Though, though, that comes about because of the emotions that we have that shut down the process of reproduction properly within our own body. Now, so if we are aware of that, we understand that our emotions are causing us to grow old and die for a start. Nothing, nothing other than what we hold on to inside of us that's unloving causes us to grow old and die. So even our death, nat so-called naturally, is an unnatural event in the sense that it doesn't have to happen the way it currently happens. So that's the first thing to understand. Secondly, if we die before that natural event occurs, in other words, our own natural ageing process is kicked in because of the different emotions that we've shut down, and normally under those circumstances we might die when we're 90, let's say, years of age, but all of a sudden, we're faced with an event when we're 35 and we die. So it might be an accident, a car accident, let's say. We're driving along in the car, bang, you know, and a big accident occurs and I die instantly or shortly after. Now, accidental events like that are a combination of what is called our law of attraction working in lots of different areas. And our guardian cannot undo our own law of attraction. He can't reverse what we are attracting. He can only drop ideas into our mind and thoughts into our brain. Don't drive on that road today or something like that. Now, um, last time we were here, um, D it was uh, Dionysus. Dionysus, wasn't it, who, yeah. who had his guides telling him. He drove a motorbike around the place very fast and his guides were telling the, him that if he continued driving his motorbike, he would die. Um, and given his emotions that he had going on at the time, because of the way he was driving his motorbike and the, way, and the way he felt, he would attract an accident that would be a very severe accident and cause his death. Now, his guides weren't trying to frighten him. They were just trying to tell him that if he continued with his current emotional condition, driving a motorcycle the way he was driving it because of his emotional condition, then he would end up passing and they try, they're trying to prevent his passing. Now, as it turned out, uh, he, what he decided to do was put his motorcycle in the shed, <laughs> and, and so he is still alive. We met him last, uh, a couple of days ago, <laughs> and he's still alive now, and I asked him what happened to his motorbike, and he said, uh, it's still in the shed, or I think he's parked it out in front of the police station, actually, I think he said, <laughs> somewhere nearby his town, in, in his location. And uh, he's not riding it at all. And, uh, and for that reason, he's still alive because he didn't change his emotions. He's just changed one action, which now has prevented his own passing. So accidents, the, the thing to understand about accidents, uh, accidents are when our guardian 
finds it impossible to, to, to stop us from taking an action that causes our own death. And also our guides have been unable to confront the error within us, the error in Emotionally, the world, yeah. that is causing the attraction. Yeah. So our guides would never tell us what to do uh, to avoid the, our, uh, what our soul is attracting, but they would tell us, be continually guiding us to the errors that are within us hmm. that we can heal and thus change what we're going to attract. So an accident happens, sorry. So, so what, what Mary's saying, yeah. if I can summarise it a bit, is the guide's role is to help you address the emotional issues that cause your law of attraction. Your guardian's role is to try to just prevent the accident. <laughs> that's, that's all they have to do. But, but they often cannot do that unless you change, unless something changes inside of yourself. And that's your guide's role, to help that thing change so that you don't attract the same events. Yeah. You want yeah. that? No, that was what that was I was going to say. Yeah. yeah. Does that answer your question? No. Well, I haven't answered it completely yet. Addiction part. No. Addiction. Uh, yes. Someone, yeah. Yeah. someone who can live to 90 but be like in and out of uh, rehab and uh, yes. rarely have a, a rough time. Yes. And to everybody around him too. Yes. Yeah. Well, there's two other aspects I haven't answered yet. One was disease yeah. and then the third one was addiction. And... Um, Interestingly, the disease issue is very, very similar to the accident issue in that there are a certain set of emotional conditions inside of our soul um, that create disease. As all of you know, your body right now is full of diseases, but none of them can take a hold in your body because it automatically clears out the disease through processes. So, so there are certain viruses that you have in your stomach right now some of which might even kill you if they got out of control. But they don't get out of control because of your soul. Your emotions are in a place where it fixes that problem before it gets out of control. And it encourages your body systems and all of your um, systems that look after disease to, to fix the issue before it gets out of control. The only time that disease then can occur is if the emotional issue is so big that your body now responds in a different manner to the emotion. So instead of clearing away the disease, it now embraces the disease, whatever that disease would be. And, and therefore your body enters a process then where your soul's emotions, because of the denial of the different emotions and different conditions of love inside of your soul, cause the disease to firstly grow and then to spread and then enough to kill you. Now, during that process, those emotions are often the same emotions that different spirits have. And many spirits who died from exactly that same disease finish up connecting to the person with exactly the same emotions. Now, for that reason, many times the disease goes very rapidly through the system. And this is what happens many times with cancers and diabetes and other forms of illnesses like that where spirits actually finish up connecting to the body and if you can see the spirits you can actually see where they're physically connected to the body influencing the disease and its and its progression and uh, and then there are other spirits who try to keep you alive and they connect to you and they try to keep the system going they try to fix the system and these both sets of spirits have different motivations for doing so and often a person will stay alive for a period of time, even though it looks like they're going to die at any moment, and it's other spirits keeping them alive, and their own fear draws those spirits to keeping them alive. Now, that is a second condition, the disease condition, that is often heavily influenced by spirits. And what are our guardians doing and our guides doing? In now, yeah, spirit? the question is that, yeah. yeah. So what our guardians trying to do is prevent those spirits from connecting to us. But unfortunately, because we have the same emotional condition that those spirits have, there's a, it's very hard for them to say, stop doing that, when inside of us we have a feeling as, oh, I want that. And so they are often trying now to work against the addiction or against the emotion that we're trying to present, present, prevent. And because to do that would be against God's law, the guardian then has to step back and let the process occur as it's occurring. In other words, the guardian can no longer really protect us from the process 
that we ourselves have engaged. Our guide is still trying to tell us things like, this disease can be cured. This disease, and see, this is why a lot of people then go for physical cures and they go here and go there trying to, they eat differently because our, their guide's trying to tell them this disease can be cured, but unfortunately most of our guides are trying to tell us how it's going to be cured is by releasing an emotion that causes the onset of the disease. And most of us, by the time we have the disease, are very reticent, very unwilling to release the emotion that caused the disease. And so we are very blocked to that. So that's the second issue with regard to disease. The third issue is regard to <coughs> with regard to addictions. Addictions are always involving spirits of a lower condition. So if I'm addicted to smoking cigarettes, for example, I know inside of me, and there's plenty of evidence around outside of me, that I am shortening my own life. Now, no person in their right mind, as the saying goes, chooses to shorten their own life willingly, and no person in their right mind would actually pay to shorten their own life. <laughs> Does that make sense? So the fact that I'm doing that means there must be some fairly heavy emotional influences upon my choice. And it could be that I'm very sad inside, and so therefore I have this sort of feeling, so much sadness that, that, I, that I just feel like it doesn't really worry me or matter to me what happens to my body. Now, unfortunately, that sadness will connect with a spirit who's sad, who's passed over, who still has a longing to have cigarettes, to smoke cigarettes. And so that spirit connects to us because he gets to share the cigarette with us in the connection. And so while I'm smoking, I'm now not only just smoking for myself, I'm smoking for a sad spirit who's connected with me as well. And so then when I try to give it up, I feel motivation from that spirit to continue doing it. And that's why it's very, very hard for us to give up a lot of our addictions because we have actually heavily spirit influence causing us to continue the addiction. And you gave the example of someone who lives to 90, but they're in and out of rehab. Very often that's, you think, my gosh, how can their body still be surviving? They're injecting chemicals. Or, or, but very often it is because there's a number of spirits around them who are invested on in keeping that body going For so they can get possible. the high uh, as many times as they, as they can before this person passes and they yeah. have to find a new one. Yeah. My, my grandfather uh, was a very... Um, he was, he was basically a drunkard. He uh, spent most of his life from midday onwards totally drunk. He would drink one flagon. In Australia, we have a four-litre flagon of port every day he would drink. And, and most people go, how come he wasn't dead, like, doing this to himself? But because he was sharing it with spirits, you see. And, and, and those spirits kept his body alive, <laughs> literally, <laughs> sharing his <laughs> one. <laughs> and unintentional, that one. <laughs> and so what, what was happening is they would keep him alive longer and longer. And eventually he had, he had part of his liver cut out and he lost a kidney, I think, as well. And he still kept drinking, still kept drinking. And yet... He, most people thought like he should be dead by the time he was 40 with the amount of alcohol he was drinking. He died, I think, when he was 66 or 64. So he lived a long time considering the amount of abuse he was dishing out to his own body. So, AJ, it's right to say that even spirits in very low conditions can still give energy to our spirit body to keep it maintaining the physical body. Yes. They can still add to it. Uh, they still have that... And, and they do that for codependent reasons. So, so while I'm, if I'm a spirit, while I'm keeping the guy alive, I can still share the alcohol. Mm -hmm. If he dies, I've got to go and find another person to share the alcohol with, and there's already other spirits connected with that person. <laughs> and then I'm, you know, so, yeah, so I'm very invested in keeping this guy alive for as long as possible. And, uh, and many times they keep them alive for very long periods of time while they are in and out of rehab, in and out of all sorts of other problems throughout their life. And, uh, and usually it's only, these spirits only disconnect when, they are, when the person on earth is physically present, prevented 
from actually having the addiction met. So, for example, if a person who's a drunkard goes to jail and he can't drink anymore, now the spirit with him is very frustrated. And it's highly likely that he will leave him and go to another person who is drinking still, and he'll leave him alone. But as soon as he goes out of jail, what does the spirit get him to do? So oftentimes, walk straight to a pub or a, somewhere where he can buy alcohol and he has his first drink and it's back into the addiction again. Exactly the same process occurring again. And unless we actually heal the emotional reason why the addiction occurs inside of us, these spirits can influence us in any direction they want based on as long as their direction is where we want to go as well. So, we can be so where's our gardener right in? Now, in that state, guardian our guardian is going, what's, go <laughs> what's going on? That's where our guardian, uh, they don't get frustrated because many of them are in a better space than that. But they're going, what can we do to, to have this person deal with this emotion that causes them to turn to drink all the time? And so, you know, if the person gets slapped in jail for all their drinking, let's say, then they might give them literature. You know, they might try to get literature there where the person sees that they have to um, stop drinking to, before they're going to make any progress. Some people find God, at, and that's almost influenced by their guardian as, as an alternative to, <laughs> to getting drunk all the time. Um, and so that they, will, they will use as many efforts as they can to, to prevent the lower spirits from connecting to the person, from the lower spirit entities I'm talking about connecting to the person, but they can't physically force that to occur. They can't force the person. Yeah. And that's the limitation they have. They have to still honour the free will of the person. Yeah. 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 Very good question. Mm -hmm. Very good question. All right, well, what we'd like to do now is read to you what uh, Mary's guide, uh, well, what your guides actually have channeled through Mary as to how you can get in contact with them better than you currently are. Does that make sense? Now, some of the things they're going to read to you are very practical. That, right? and, and I have to say, this started as an exercise for me that my guides came to me yesterday and started giving me a list of things and um, uh, so keep in mind that I'm working on this stuff too and it is very practical they wanted it to be very practical things that I could do so um, and also they're so excited they, they were so excited this morning M many of them have been around you all your life and they never had the opportunity to have more of a connection with you so they were so excited this morning that we would talk to you about this topic yeah Okay, so practical ways to stay connected with your spirit guides and guardians. The very first thing they said to me, and they say this to me often, is that it's very important to stay hydrated, um, to drink plenty of water, plain water. <laughs> not not flavoured. Not tea. Not tea, not coffee. Yeah. <laughs> Just water. Not yeah. alcohol. Not yeah. alcohol, yeah. Water. <laughs> <laughs> and they told me that I need to drink at least three litres a day. And that's... At least? Yeah. At least. Yeah. For a woman, at least three litres a day. For a man, even more. Four litres. At times, my guys have told me six litres a day. Oh, boy. Where I was going through different things, six litres. When you're processing a lot, they said it's got to be more. It's got to be more. And, and I don't know if you've uh, done some heavy processing, but whenever I do, I always just drink so much more anyway. But... They said with Can we explain why water is so essential to your connection? Well, they say a bit later on, but yeah, uh, go ahead. Well, they can also explain if they yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And they can explain through Mary why water is, but I'll, I'll start. Um, as you know, 70% or so of your body is water. Also, in the spirit world, 70 or more percent of a spirit person's body is water. Right? It's just in a different uh, form. It's in a gaseous form rather than a liquid form. So a spirit, spirits, it's like vapour, if you can think of it as vapour. Now, 
if they are going to communicate with you, it makes sense that water is going to have to be at the same level for, for good communication to take place. Now, if you think about it in a practical way, sound travels through water much better than sound travels through air. Do you know that? No. Much faster. It travels at a much higher speed through water than it does through air, and therefore with much more clarity. So even if they attempt to speak with you so that you can hear it, if you're well hydrated, the sound will travel better and with more clarity, even if it's to do with speaking. But the way many spirits also speak with you is through your emotions. And emo to feel your own emotions, you need to have lots of hydration. Mm. You need to drink water so that you can feel yourself better. And when you feel yourself better, because all of our emotions are actually conducted through the moisture in our body, if you can feel yourself better, then you can feel spirits around you better. And if you can feel spirits around you better, then you can feel what their intentions are and what their desires are better. Mm. So um, if, if you don't drink water, you stop this ability of being able to conduct emotions between you or even feel your own emotions, but also the ability to conduct emotions to others through the moisture that's in your body. And it's very important to understand that, that your emotions are very much influenced by water. Also, by the way, the emotion of love is highly, can highly influence water, more than any other substance. Now, many of you may have read about the different experiments that certain people have done in Japan and so forth about how love influences the structure of water. So, if a spirit is in a very high condition of love, can you see that water is the necessary part for him to con conduct his love to you, for you to be able to sense or feel his love, or hers for that matter? Now, if a spirit is in a very low condition, then they will be less. Inf then, then they are less able to to influence us when we have high amounts of hydration. For exactly the same reasons, because because the higher the condition of love, the more water we have in our body, the easier it is for love to influence our body. In a lower condition of hydration the harder it is for love to influence our body, and so therefore darker emotions can influence our body more easily. Can you see the relationship? So water is really, really important part. Uh, now, if you analyse how much you drink in a day, most people would only drink one to two litres a day, if that. Many less than that. Um, as soon as I get up, I drink one to two litres. As soon as I get up. Like, so the moment I wake up, down goes two litres of water, right? And, and it's pretty easy to do once you get used to it. And in fact, your body hungers for it after a while. You actually find your body longing for that amount of water the instant that you get up. And, uh, and this is a part of what will happen as you get more and more connected with your guides. You will definitely want to drink more water. And by the way, you will stop... You, you won't like some water either because some waters have uh, high bicarbonates in them and I've noticed here in Greece many, much of your bottled water has very high levels of bicarbonates um, so, and it makes the water taste quite funny sometimes you need to go for water that's very low levels of bicarbonates in it and um, this one that, that I... This was I bought this uh, the bottle of this in the the in in uh, England before we came to Greece, and I looked through the entire shop, <laughs> and every bottle had bicarbonate levels higher than two hundred and fifty, and this was the only one that had one under 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 eighty bicarbonate levels, so that was the one I got. <laughs> right? Yep. Good question. Yep. And Joy, you had a question too, didn't you? 
a science question. Uh, what you say? a bit further away from you. That's it. What do you say about the water? Is the ppm parts per million? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, if it's it, a lot of the bicarbonates, if you look at the water, you'll see a lot of your bicarbonates here are 250 parts per million, and it's very, very high, and you can actually taste it in the water. If you go for lower than 70, and there's some water that you can buy uh, even here that's sort of lower than 20, but if it's lower than 70, you will actually enjoy the water more, your body will enjoy the water more, but it's actually, uh, and it would be easier to drink higher amounts of water as a result. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, for some reason I forgot the other question. Uh, ah, yes. I heard from science that a lot of water can cause problems to the kidneys, have the opposite effect. Mm -hmm. That's what medicine dictates now. I And agree. I know it because my grandfather has an issue with kidneys. Yes. There's a theory in a lot of medicine that if you drink too much water, that, uh, and in fact in practice you can drink too much water. However, um, your body, it's to do with the uh, uh, soluble salts in your body as to what happens when you drink too much water. So as long as you keep up your mineral intake, and the way to do that the best is by having a natural salt of some kind, so rather than using um, salt that is highly refined, you get a salt like Him Himalayan salt or something like that that has a whole variety of 80 or so minerals in it. And whenever you have salt during the day, you, you use that kind of salt rather than a completely demineralized salt. And if you do that and still drink large amounts of water, you will not have any problems. As I said, I drink four to five litres of water every single day and I don't have any problems with any of those kind of things. So, um, it seems to me to be a relationship between how much you're processing your emotion as well, though. Yes. If you aren't emotionally open, <laughs> I think you could overdo the water. But if you're... It's like a... I don't know. What the it, the more you emotionally process, the more toxins are getting released into mm -hmm. your bloodstream yeah. because your, your body holds on to the toxins uh, while you're holding on to the emotions. As you release the emotions, your body now needs to clear these toxins out of its system, and water is the best possible way for your body to clear toxins out of your system. So when I was doing a lot of emotional processing work, uh, my spirit friends wanted me to drink six litres of water every day, and, um, and I found that really easy to do, actually, um, as well. It was really easy to do. Uh, two litres went as soon as I got up, And then it was only four litres for the rest of the day. And that was very, very easy to do. Um, the less you emotionally process, the less water you will need to clear away toxins. But if you want to stay connected with your spirit friends, you need to drink three litres of water whether you uh, have toxins in your body or not. Yes? Yep. So, um. Alicia. Um, so... If, you, if you're feeling some resistance to going into your emotions, yes. would it assist to drink more water to yes. help you go into your emotions yes. more? And to be in water or to connect with water? Yes. Particularly to drink more water. Because yeah. uh, to drink more water, your body then is able to conduct emotions better. Mm -hmm. um, So it's far better if you can drink higher amounts of water if you're resistive emotionally. Yeah. Unfortunately, when we're resistive emotionally, it's we have a high to tendency drink. to turn to carbohydrates yes. and other okay. foods, and we have a tendency to drink far less. Yeah. So unfortunately, it's a lot harder when we're resistive emotion to drink large amounts of water. Yeah. yeah. Do our spirit friends want to add anything about water? No, I need to go to the toilet. I'm, yeah, so do I. So, do you want to go first, yeah, yeah. and then you can? Then I'll relate the next one. Yeah. yeah. And then I'll when you come back, yeah. I'll go. Yeah. You get my <laughs> Unless shot. everybody wants to go to the to toilet because you drank too much water. <laughs> do you want a break? No. You know my shorthand there. Yeah. Your, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, gotcha. yeah. Okay. So, is there any more questions about the water? Just one. Just one, George. Yes. Um, if we. Mike, yeah. Is the same true of divine love? Do we see divine love? Yes, yes. Um, we are far more conductive 
to receiving divine love when we're well hydrated. Mm. Yes. Mm. And um, um, you were talking about the lower level spirits. Are they less likely to be hydrated, or are the spirit bodies the same? They drink far less water. Okay. Um, yes. Yep. Um, Sarah? Is it a good idea to uh, not bless your water but send it a lot of love before you drink it due to like if you buy it in the shop it might have a lot of emotions, you know, like those experiments? Like any, any prayer for love of anything is going to help it, certainly. However, in the end it doesn't change the chemical composition of the water you're drinking. So if your water you're drinking has high carbonate levels, bicarbonate levels for example, Praying about your water is not going to lower the bicarbonate levels. <laughs> Do you understand? Yeah. It may help the structure of the water in terms of beneficial to your body, but in terms of your taste buds, you're probably still going to taste it much the same and therefore not want to drink it as much. And, and I, I just find it interesting how high carbonate levels... I, I'm noticing more and more that bottled water is containing higher and higher carbonate levels. Mm -hmm. And there are certain uh, medical reasons why... People are doing that, um, but unfortunately, none of them benefit your body. I feel, and um, when you have the lo low carbon levels in the, in the water, it's, it, it feels much better to the body, and also your taste buds enjoy it yeah. far more as well. I consider myself a water connoisseur. Like yeah, yeah. you can really taste the difference, and fresh rainwater is just fresh rainwater is yeah the best. <laughs> delicious. Yeah, delicious. Yeah, if we go back there. Thanks. Um, hi, I'm Caroline. Hello, Carol. Hi. Um, it was just really um, a comment I was feeling about uh, other ways of hydrating your body. Yeah. Um, if we only ate things that we were designed to eat, um, that were not toxic, so fresh fruit and vegetables, vegetables yep. then um, your body is in less stress to process any other toxins so if we're not eating yeah we'll get um, to that the spirit process. friends have actually okay. got that in the list <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. 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 So yeah. just if people are finding it difficult to suddenly start drinking four liters of water that to switch to only eating fresh fruit and vegetables could well usually mine. the same people who find it difficult to drink water generally yeah. also <laughs> find it difficult That's to switch so to a veg vegetable diet so <laughs> yeah we do eat lots of um raw food and uh, a lot of fruit and vegetables. And they still recommend it for me to have three liters a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep. Now, I haven't done the next one, and okay. I'm going to go and do go okay. the lead. All right. So the next one was get connected with your body and it. Oh, sorry. Could it's I, a water question. Yeah, yep. I'll, I'll see if I can field it. <laughs> um, AJ did mention a couple of nights ago about there's water available in the spirit world. Yes. And I felt a really pushing, where can we find this water? Like, where is the in water? In the spirit world? In the spirit world. Yeah. So you want it now? Or? <laughs> it's a reservoir of I don't know. It was like, <laughs> like it was an idea that, I, like, it's like a feeling like they didn't know that they could have water. And where is the oh, water? You mean from spirits. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well... Sometimes when spirits are in like low conditions, then they are in a condition where they feel thirst constantly because of the, the error that's within them and the location that they find themselves in. So for any spirit who's feeling like, I'm really thirsty and where's the water, the key thing would be to encourage them to feel like what they're feeling <laughs> and that help is available to them, that they're going to have to be humble to deal with some, some of the, the reasons why they're in a place where they're really thirsty. But if they're willing to do that, then definitely they can get the water. But they, they have to be open to someone coming and, and giving them some help around humility. Yeah. Do you feel that answers their question? Yeah, because it was... Um, they thought that there is a spring and that they couldn't get to Just, it. Yeah. And... But they're not understanding that it's actually, um, firstly, they have to feel emotions. Yeah. So like everything in the spirit world, um, 
the the restriction that we have on the location that we're in is all about the condition of our soul. So for them, if they're finding that they can't find water and they really want water, then it as I said earlier, it's about something within them that they're holding on to. So if they're willing to be open to that, then someone can lead them definitely to water. Yeah. Mm. Okay. All right. Next one. So is that one done? Is it? No, not yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we just had a question from some spirits who are looking for water. They, oh, they yes. feel thirsty, and we just talked yeah. about why they might be like that. Yeah. yeah. In the in the lower levels of the spirit world, there are very there isn't very much water, but but water is available at any time as long as you have a longing for it, and spirits can lead you to the water that you can drink in the spirit world. But often in the very dark regions of the spirit world. Uh, people do not drink for long periods of time. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Next point is about getting connected with your body and its feelings. So they encouraged us all to feel our emotions and where they are stored in the body. And they say that we are close to you, but we can't communicate with you when you are in your head and more attuned to the feelings of others rather than your own feelings. We recommend gentle exercise, breath, being still and tuning into your feelings and sensations in your body. We communicate with your spirit body and not always with words or thoughts. The more hydrated you are and the more in connection with your physical body sensations you are, the more sensitive you will become to your spirit body's feelings and interactions. Does that make sense to everyone? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're suggesting that we need to um, be careful about exercise that actually stresses you heaps mm -hmm. and you do it because you're uh, addicted to sort of really pushing the envelope. So while that kind of exercise can certainly improve your general fitness, and it's okay if that's your goal, to improve your general fitness. Um, that form of exercise isn't good to connect you to your feelings. So you need to be gentle, gentle connections to connect with your feelings. You need to connect to the body to yeah. connect to the feelings. And for me, this is a really big one because I used to be a jogger and I loved jogging. Um, and in retrospect, I feel I loved it because it got me out of my feelings you know I'd go for a jog it'd be quite tough and then I'd feel whoa I've got a little endorphin high and felt really good and fit and strong and my guides lately are really um, emphasizing to me gentle touch be gentle with your body allow gentle touch um, be more in tune like I realized that my whole attitude towards my physical body has been pushing always pushing and and really even the sensitivity of my skin is not very sensitive because I'm there's a lot of emotion stored in me that I'm resisting that makes me want to detune from my physical body all the time and what they were saying this morning is you need to be connected to that part it's like you need to be in your body and and we know this about emotional processing but even more they're saying so that we can even guide you better if you if you can be in connection with yourself hmm. yeah. 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 So, if our skin is softer, uh, our senses are softer, they, they can communicate with us easily. More easily, yeah. 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 When you say your skin is softer, Nicole. Sometimes I, I notice that my skin uh, changes. I, I don't know why, probably about feeling. I, that's my explanation. Mm. And uh, when I'm more open, it, my skin becomes softer. Mm -hmm. Especially my fingertips. Yeah. That's how I get it. Yeah, yeah. The the reality is that your your whole body becomes the more sensitive you become in your whole body to your own body's feelings, the more easily it, it, it more easy it is for spirits to talk with you. It, the more detuned you are from your own body and its sensations and feelings, the more difficult it is for spirits who are of higher condition to speak with you. Spirits of lower condition continue to speak with you quite easily, 
but the spirits of higher condition, which is what our guides and our guardians are, find it more difficult to connect to us. So, so we need to learn to become more sensitive emotionally and we need to become more sensitive to our body and its own pains and its aches. Most of us are still trying to run away from our body's pains and aches uh, because every time we tune in, we feel the pain and then we want to run and get some kind of tablet to stop that pain from happening. And what we need to do is become more in tune with our body rather than detuned from our body. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, I would like to ask, um, I was trying to process some fear a couple of days ago. Yeah. And normally I do get different sort of, I don't know, little pains around. Like I know that this is stored here, like indications, as you say. Yeah. But this time was very different. I felt really strong pain under my feet yep. but like really really severe pain yep. and uh, like it never happened to me before and I was like okay stay there I was trying to breathe so I don't know if I was resisting or I needed more water or it was like that was I'm trying to say that was part of the process or was it I don't know how, how do you stay like when it's really the first thing we need to understand is that is that fear creates pain so if, if you're processing your fear and you find that your pain intensifies, then it means you're not fully getting into your fear yet. And instead, probably trying to push your fear away from you. And usually under those circumstances, it's our extremities, our feet and our hands, that feel the full extent of the rejection of the fear. And so they have the strongest pains. So what we need to learn to do is when we're in fear, once we accept our fears completely, we'll find that pain will greatly de-intensify. De it'll, it'll, it'll reduce quite significantly the pain once we fully embrace the fear itself. It's only the process of rejection of the fear that causes the pain to intensify. So, so what I would do under those circumstances is stop what I'm processing for a moment and ask myself, why, what, what are, it, what's the feeling I have that's trying to push, this, push the fear away from me rather than to embrace it? Do, do you understand? Um, once I identify what I'm trying to do, you'll find your pain will lessen quite significantly. Yeah? It's the pain is always the creation of the fear being blocked from our experience. In other words, we store it, we hold on to the fear, and that's what intensifies our pain. Yeah. 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 All right, ready for number three? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, eat mainly live, light food. So natural things like fruit and vegetables, nuts. Avoid stuffing yourself with starch and carbohydrates. These things dull your senses and encourage a numbness in your physical body. So. so I don't know if you notice, but have you noticed that when you get a bit stressed out, you want to go for either something sweet or something that's got fairly high carbohydrates generally mm -hmm. when you get a bit stressed out. Mm -hmm. And that, that is the result. That, this is a way of avoiding the stress. We, we, so we feel a bit stressed, and so we go for the foods that help numb us down, that cause us to detune from the stress. Mm -hmm. What they are encouraging is that instead of doing that, we eat the foods that allow us to be completely connected with our senses. And that way, if we're stressed, instead of trying to numb out our stress, we'll try to deal with our stress in a different way. We'll try to find out what's stressing us and correct that instead of trying to numb out from the stress. Does that make sense? The strong message yeah. is, we can't connect to you unless you're connected to you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah. 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 So a lot of this advice is a lot of very practical, simple advice about staying connected to yourself. Yeah. 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 Now remember that spirits who are in darker conditions will find it easier to connect to you when you use the opposite technique. So, if instead of eating light, live food, like fruit and vegetables, you, you start eating meats and high carbohydrate starches, high processed food, then spirits who are in darker condition 
find it easier to connect to you in that condition. That also, yeah, when we're in avoidance of our general body's feelings, when we want to get our out of our body, then darker spirits love that. They can they can certainly use your body. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's why they want to use your body oftentimes to get some of their own needs met. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Is there any questions about the food? Uh, okay, it's a bit more simple. Mm. Okay, the fourth one is foster imagination and creativity in your life in whatever way that you're drawn to do this. We can communicate inspiration to you better when your mind is open to new possibilities. So I find that one quite a beautiful one and very like relevant. It, it's about a state of... The way they talk to me about it is like having... When we're imagining things, when we're creating things, when we're in a more of a childlike state, our mind is open to learning and to receiving new ideas. And so if we engage in those things in whatever way they are in our day-to-day -day life, they have much more capacity to inspire us in different ways and to lead us in different directions. Yeah. Many of us sort of sit back and wait for creativity or wait for imagination or wait for inspiration. But the reality is it's by taking action. So once you feel inspired... You, a part of this inspiration needs to be to take action because when you're taking action things can change and, and they say this to you a bit later as well mm. this importance of firstly allowing the imagination to work but then don't just sit there and allow the imagination to work do something about it mm. take an action as well yeah and when we were in Sweden our friend Anna was asking us about her guides and I felt very strongly they just arrived and said she needs to start painting she likes painting and if she paints it will it's not just through the painting that we can inspire her but it will it will open her to a a, a creative side of herself that has been really shut down with her intellect and so um, by doing activities that open us to that part of ourselves, they can have much more influence. Mm. Mm. <coughs> Is there any questions about the imagination? Like, oftentimes we, when we were children, imagination was usually fairly encouraged, yes? When we get to be adults, oftentimes imagination is quite severely discouraged, isn't it? It's almost like what, in, what, that, what encouraged us, what, how our parents encouraged us when we were children... Now we get discouraged doing when we're an adult. If we allow our imagination to be fostered all the time, then we can develop what I feel is a quality of faith as well, where we start thinking about what our potential is. We imagine the, the potential that is greater than what we currently can achieve. Yeah. And, and this is a very important part of communication with our spirit friends because... Our spirit friends have already reached the potential that we can only imagine. So if we allow ourselves to imagine what that potential could be, they have a greater means of communicating with us and helping us to assist us with specific truths to help us to reach that potential. You will only ever grow to the point where you believe you can grow to. Do, do, do you understand what I mean? So, so if you believe you can only grow to that much, that's the only amount you will grow to. But if you believe you can grow to that much, now you have the capacity of growing far more. It's what you believe severely limits your ability to grow. Now, what, what the beauty of imagination is, it causes you to imagine things beyond what you currently believe and to, to recognise them as possibilities. And when, when you do that, you now have the capacity to grow to that potential. Not the potential that you currently thought, but rather this new potential that you imagine. Yeah. So it's very important. I, I remember as a kid somebody saying in, in art class, you have such an imagination, you can draw every hair on a bald man's head. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, sometimes... When I'm guided to do something or from the guides and guardians, uh, it feels so completely impossible out of anybody's sphere of imagination. Yeah. What I find, and this is probably where the guides are coming in, they then show you something so specific, so synchronistic, 
and it's enough to give you the faith to continue with that possibility and exactly. that potential. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's beautiful. Yeah, it's really it good. It is beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sarah. Um, a couple of days ago, um, I was feeling pretty connected and I was sitting in a church and I was crying and I didn't feel like leaving. And um, my guides were showing me these sketches they put on in the spirit world to teach like Low, like little five minute sketches that spirits put on to teach like lower level spirits just a little lesson about love but yeah. in this really fun way yeah. Yeah. and I sat there and I watched like three of them and yeah. I was like oh that's so amazing I so it's like little acting class what? for th for five minutes yeah it was yeah. so cool I yeah. think yeah. Igor has those those same spirits come and give him little sketches he's always talking <laughs> yeah, about that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember the last one involved an animal it was like a pig and I had this song in my head all day. I was like, you wouldn't need a pig like me. <laughs> like, it was something about, you know, not eating animals. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, so cool. Yeah, and yeah. I was just, yeah, like inspiration. And I was like, oh, wow. That's, yeah. You hadn't even thought about, sometimes you tell your guides to help these spirits, but then go and watch this performance. Yeah, and it'll exactly. be fun. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. really cool. Yeah. And, and uh, our guides are very versed at using all methods of communication to help somebody, not just one method. So they'll use music, art, you know, theatre, all sorts of things in order to uh, help and, and connect with people who they can't connect with. Uh, yeah. 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 Cool. That's good. Okay, next one. Take action in your life, in your passions and desires. We can give you clear and often immediate feedback when you're engaging your passions and desires in a certain direction. When you constantly sit and intellectually ponder issues, we find it difficult to give clear guidance. Beware of trying to figure everything out rather than being humble to the fact that you won't have everything right immediately and no amount of intellectual pondering will change that. We exist to lovingly guide you towards what is good, loving and true and for those of you who desire it, we would guide you to God. They're saying this is a process that you must engage. It's not, and you never reach that point immediately. So they're saying that some of the people present don't have divine love guides at the moment because there's not a strong desire for God yet. There's a strong desire to understand other things, but not yet a strong desire for God. That's fine. Whether your guides are guiding you towards God or guiding you towards those other things, the key is that if you don't follow your desires they can't work with you. They've got nothing to work with, right? So it's almost like if, we, if you say to a guy who, who says, I want a job. So a guy says, I want a job. And you ask him, well, what have you done to get a job? Oh, well, uh, nothing. You know, I've gone to the unemployment <laughs> to find out, you know, whether they've got a job for me, but I haven't tried to create one. I haven't tried to make one. So the reality is if you don't have a job, there are things you can do. There are things, steps that you can take to create a job. There's been many times in my life when I've created a job and I haven't had one before, before I began. And oftentimes those things are about creating, um, firstly, inside of yourself, the desire to do something. So, so, for example, if I just sit at home and, and say... I want to look better, right? I want my body to look better. Um, but I sit at home and all I do is eat ice cream and, and you know, potato chips. potato chips and anything else and maybe a few Big Mac McDonald's <laughs> burgers or whatever uh, a day. Then, then the li high likelihood is that my body is going to go in which direction? A <laughs> worse direction, is it? Yeah, sideways. <laughs> I will I will grow sideways. And uh, and and if I don't take any action, that possibly could continue to grow until it becomes even a danger to my own life, mm -hmm. potentially. And this is the trouble with not listening to your own desires and passions. Often what we're doing is we're sitting down still expecting the world to come to our rescue for things that we can actually engage ourselves without needing anybody's rescue. And we are often detuned from that. And what, the reason why this is such a very important issue is that spirits find it very, very difficult to lead you 
when you're already dedicated to sitting on your backside. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> if you're dedicated to just sitting here and waiting, then how can you be led? You're not already in action. Yes? It's like if you're standing at the crossroads and you're going, now which way is the best way to go? It could be that way, it could be that way. Maybe it's that way, or maybe we should go that way. Oh, I don't know, maybe we should think about it for a bit longer. They, it, they, <laughs> they give me the picture of they're like, they can't help you. If you just take a step down one of the roads, then they can then they immediately go, no, go, no, this is wrong. No, or, or yeah. So it's like you have to take the action in your life towards something that you desire and they can, they can work with that so much more dynamically than you sitting at home going, what is my desire? Yeah. I don't know. You know. You know, the last time we were in Greece, we talked a bit about earth changes, right? And many people who came, listened to that, felt quite afraid as a result of those kind of discussions. Now, I put to you that there's no need to be afraid because if we act, if we're already acting in our desires and passions, we can easily be led to the right location to survive anything. Right? Your garden guide, your guardian and, and guides, guides can can do so much to ensure your safety if you're engaged in life. If you're sitting at home terribly afraid, trying to prevent every negative possibility, they, their hands are very tied. You're really letting fear dictate. Yeah. But if you act, they have so much more capacity to intervene, to guide you. To and not only that, to also influence other people around you to bring things to you. You know, Bring things that you wouldn't have normally have found if you didn't engage your desire. So, for example, if you desire, if you like reading, for example, most of us would eventually go to a bookshop to have a look at a bookshop, wouldn't we, if we liked reading? So, in that process, how can a guide help you? Well, he can influence what you now choose on the bookshelf. Does that make sense? But if you sat home waiting for some person to give you a book, many people will only do that at Christmas time or <laughs> some other <laughs> birthday, <laughs> and, and if they know that you like to read. But aside from that, how can the guide influence you? It can't unless you start to do something that will engage at least a part of this desire that you have that they can then influence in a direction that will benefit you. And this is very important to remember with all of our life. We can't process, progress with their assistance without actually doing something, without actually taking action of some kind. Yeah? Very important to remember. Joy. Joy? I think Mary answered the question, but it's like another example would be just being stuck in your fear. It's not necessarily just being stuck in your backside, but stuck in your fear or stuck in your anger or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Whenever we're stuck in an emotion of any kind, mm. we are automatically going to have a problem, aren't we? Because, it, mm. because we're already resistant to getting any inspiration of any kind mm. to help us with that emotion. So, so with fear, for example, if you know you're afraid, you're far better off taking an action of some kind than you are staying stagnant and responding to your fear instead. Mm -hmm. You're far better off going and doing something. If you know you're afraid and you're not connecting to it, you're far better off going and doing something because then something might happen which will trigger the fear. Whereas if you stay at home because you know you're afraid, nothing's happening and it's highly unlikely you will even get into your fear in that place. Yeah. 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 All right, ready for the next one? Yeah. Make time for prayer, quiet and feelings. Don't fill every space in your day with noise and activity. Spend time away from the computer, TV, phone and music. Be in nature, be creative, focus on feeling yourself and longing for God. Too often you are engaged with the feelings of others and preoccupied with pleasing them. Our focus is on your best welfare and growth. Many of you do not share our focus, <laughs> so this impedes our communication. By disengaging from pleasing others and beginning to make growth your priority, we will find guiding you so much easier. So that makes sense, doesn't it? Like, yeah. How many of you do find that in the course of a day you try to get five or ten minutes of quiet time for yourself and, and yet hardly that even happens sometimes? It's just like busy this, busy that, busy this, busy that, and before you know it, the whole day's been busy and you've not had any time to actually sit and just feel without any external thing happening. And what, what they're suggesting is you need hours of time a day mm. that you actually are able to actually sit and feel without any external influence of any kind. 
Now, in our highly techn technical and technological society, the more technology, it seems, the more demands, it seems, it has on our time, and the less we're often engaged with feeling ourselves. Yeah. So we need to address that. We can change that. We can give ourselves more time. Often at home, our phones all go off. Uh, we pull them out of the wall, in fact, <laughs> and so that we can get some quiet time. We, uh, myself and Mary, have a, have a tent that we sleep in, and we love it down in the tent because there is no electronics. There's no lights, there's no electronics, there's no heating, there's no cooling. We're totally connected with what's going on in our environment in that place. Um, we're not detuned from what's going on outside because we're involved in it, in the tent. Like, it's just we're involved in the process of what's happening. So if it's hot outside, it's hot in the tent. If it's cold outside, it's cold in the tent. Um, we found it a bit of a struggle when we were in Sweden because... <laughs> it's hot inside. It's, it's hot inside. Outside. It's hot inside, <laughs> like really hot, but 21, 22 degrees, 21 degrees usually. And, and then you go outside and it's like... Freezing cold, minus, <laughs> minus 15 20. or yeah. whatever. <laughs> and, and that encourages you to be detuned from the environment. You know, like, and so, and so you end up being detuned from nature, detuned from what's going on, detuned from the, the life cycle that's happening outside of you. And, and as a result, you're often detuned from yourself as a result as well. And we found that we had to turn, we turned all the heating down and that still wasn't good enough. So we finished up opening the doors <laughs> and let some of the minus 15 inside so that we could uh, feel a bit more in tune with everything that was going on around us rather than feeling out of tune or out of harmony with it. And at home, we find that quite easy because living uh, and being in a tent fairly frequently, like every night we usually sleep in it, and uh, for a fair portion of the day, we're usually there. And we find it's very easy to be involved with what's going on around us uh, and what's going on outside. We feel a lot more connected to ourselves and to nature. And then in that place, we get a lot of inspiration as well. Mm. A lot of inspiration. A lot of the talks that I've given have all come from <laughs> inspiration in that place. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's the same for Mary too with a lot of the things that she's been inspired with. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. This other thing that's important we wanted to raise to your intention too, though, what they're saying is this preoccupation with other people's feelings. This is a big problem on the planet today where everybody's worried about what everybody else thinks. Mm -hmm. Everybody's worried about what everybody else feels about them. Right? And when we worry so much about what other people feel or think about us, we are not very connected to ourselves and what we feel and think. Yeah? And that's not a very positive place for us to be guided. And it's also not a very positive place for our life because we finish up doing things that other people want us to do rather than doing things for ourselves, what we want to do, engaging our desires and passions. Mm. Yeah. Do you have any questions about that? Fairly obvious what's happening there? Mm. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, each of you is a unique individual with specific interests, talents and passions. We are too, <laughs> all individuals, and we have been allocated to you because we share common passions and personality traits with you. You may come to view us as friends, for this is how we feel for you, with much love and regard. We care deeply for your welfare, but do not feel ourselves to be your superiors. When you regard us as lofty, dispassionate and without a life and character of our own, you distance yourselves from us. While it is true that many of us are now completely free from error, we have all lived a life on earth and we understand the trials and difficulties you face in your growth towards your true self and towards God. When you regard us as pure, you often have the feeling or belief that we cannot understand you. We wish to tell you that we do. This is how we have come to be your guide. Please feel that you can get to know us. 
as a dear friend. This will help us to be in better rapport. So that one's fairly clear. It's just nice, that one. <laughs> they, they love us so much, but they also want to, to, us to see them as people rather than see them as some high and mighty With being. With harps and... Uh... <laughs> you know, playing the harp and just looking down upon us and going, yeah, she's having that problem again. Yeah. <laughs> they're not like that, you know. They, they're engaged with our lives. And they don't judge us either. Mm. Like, they're not, they realise, many of them realise that they've had exactly the same kind of life or even worse life when they were on earth than we had. They, they often feel that they made many much worse choices than what you are currently making. And, and so they often have a lot of compassion and understanding for everything that's happening in our lives, rather than judgment and, uh, and, and snobbing their noses at us. They don't feel that way at all. So what we thought we'd do is maybe have a break now, and then after the break, we'll actually engage this in a more practical way by speaking with some of your guides. Does that sound good? Yeah. And also speaking with some of the spirits around you that the guides notice that are around you, even. So there'll be, as I explained earlier, there'll be your guide and your guardian, and then there'll be sometimes just spirits that are around you that are just interested in your life, and then there'll be some malevolent spirits generally around us as well. Every single person on earth has to endure this unfortunate mix, if you like, based on what we're attracting. And if we can uh, talk with some of these spirits, you'll get a far better practical picture of what's actually happening around us rather than just assuming that everything that's happening is pretty standard and straightforward. It often is straightforward, but it's not very standard. You know, we have lots of different things happening around us generally that we're completely unaware of. And it's only when we start talking about it that we realise, oh, that thought that dropped into my mind last Tuesday, that wasn't mine. It was somebody else's. And that thought that happened the other day was along these lines, that wasn't mine either. That was some, another person's. And and we start understanding far better what are the influences upon our lives and how we can engage the positive influences and at the same time detune ourselves from the negative influences a bit. And, and, uh, and so hopefully through this process, this practical process, we can engage that with you for the, for the next few hours after we have a break. So let's have a break now, shall we, for, for half an hour or so. I think there's some, there's some food there, isn't there? Um, that you might want to eat and go to the toilet. There's two toilets, I understand, available. So.